Thank you, Noah, for leading us in worship. And thank you, choir, and all who have participated in guiding us into God's presence. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. Speaking of Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Scholars uh, think that this passage, verses 15 through 20, was originally a hymn that the early Christians sang in worship and that Paul is quoting this hymn as a way of focusing us on Jesus. So imagine these words set to music. Notice they're pile upon pile, these short Wonderful phrases describing Jesus, firstborn from the dead, uh, head of the church, all things created in him and through him. So lots of different ways that we can connect musically as we think about this passage. But I invite us to look at the passage this morning, the song this morning, through what would be considered a middle phrase. If you look at the middle of, uh, at the end of verse 17, And the phrase is, in him, in Jesus, all things hold together. In Jesus, all things hold together. Now, two larger ways to think about this. One is the specific sense of creative power that Jesus, along with God the Father and God the Son, used to both birth creation and to sustain creation. There is this sense that Jesus, as God the Son, as part of the Trinity, by his might, by his power, holds all things together. Verse 16 speaks to this when at the beginning of the verse, uh, Paul says, For in Jesus all things in heaven and on earth were created. And at the end of the verse he says, All things have been created through him and for him. If we think of the one who holds all things together as also being the one through whom uh, all things have been made, we think of this incredible divine power for life and the gift of life and the gift of creation. And we think of Jesus being present in the unfolding of the history of creation, present, actively engaged as the one who holds all things together. But not just the beginning of creation, but the fulfillment of creation or the finishing of creation. Verse 18, there's this wonderful verse tucked in there that says Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. It's a reference first to the resurrection. God raised Jesus from the dead. But it's also a reference to that day when the dead in Christ will rise and all will be as God wills it to be, when Jesus will make all things new. Here's how it works. Jesus is the firstborn from the dead, which suggests that there will be a second and a third and a fourth and on and on and on born from the dead. A reference both to Jesus' resurrection when he births the new creation into the world and to that day when he finishes the new creation and we will be raised like him to love and serve the Lord together to tend the new creation with Jesus. So these two elements of his uh, holding things together in terms of creation at the beginning, new creation fulfilled one day, and Jesus in the meantime holding all things together, everything holding held together in him, which suggests then when it seems like our lives are not holding together, when it seems like things are falling apart for us, when it feels like the world is falling apart, we can trust and rest in the good news that in Jesus, everything 
all things hold together. Your life, mine, our church, our community, our world. We have amazing folks who prepare wonderful meals for us on Wednesday nights during the school year. Philip and Catherine Allgood do a great job in the kitchen. They have a kitchen crew that work with them to provide these blessed meals for us. They'll start back up in late August. I encourage you to come and be nourished in wonderful ways. When I was in Divinity School, I served uh, the wonderful Mount Hermon Baptist Church of uh, Orange County, North Carolina, just outside Durham. We did not have someone like the All Goods to prepare our Wednesday night meals. And so what the church in its wisdom thought it would do would be to assign the rookie pastor to go to a restaurant in town and pick up Wednesday night dinner. Now, I love this every Wednesday afternoon. I went to the Shrimp Boat Restaurant. Doesn't that sound, I mean, just, just rest in that for a moment. The Shrimp Boat Restaurant. And I would pick up for the church for Wednesday evening dinner a big tray of meats and two big trays of sides and then an abundance of hush puppies. And I considered it my pastoral duty to make sure those hush puppies were edible for the congregation. So I had to sample the hush puppies on the drive home. Does that make sense to you? Isn't that something that you would want people to do for you? Well, one Wednesday afternoon, late afternoon, the hush puppies were especially tasty. I, I mean, they were really good. So I started eating on the drive back to the church, and I did not stop. And so I participated with the congregation in eating the meat and the two sides, but also continuing to eat the hush puppies. At about hush puppy 19 or thereabouts, one of our youth challenged me to a basketball game on the court outside, and it was a challenge I could not resist. And very soon into this basketball game, I was feeling lightheaded. Can you imagine why? And just as I was about to pass out, and as I'm falling backwards, I see this beautiful, it was fall, I see this beautiful vision of a blue sky, and there, were, there was a tree canopy over the parking lot where we play basketball. I saw the, the beautiful leaves before my head banged, and I was out for just a minute. And then when I woke up, I was looking at that same vision, but then there were all these people gathered around me wondering if I was okay. For that moment, I wasn't holding things together. Things were out of control for me. Things were falling apart. It was my fault. I shouldn't have eaten those hush puppies. But it was a frightening feeling when things were not holding together for me. And every one of us, at some point along the way and at many points in the future, there will be times when it feels like things are not holding together for us. There is a medical diagnosis. There is a financial struggle. There is a relational problem. There is a, a dream that is, is not going where we thought it would go. There, there's something that's out of joint. There are things, oftentimes multiple things, happening at the same time that are seemingly not holding together for us. And then we look at the world around us and constantly we are aware of how things in the world seem to be falling apart with war and with hunger and with all manner of suffering and division and things do not seem to be holding together and it is in this moment that we turn to our faith in Jesus and the good news, the powerful, comforting, sustaining news that even when in our lives and in our world it seems like everything is separating from where it should be, Jesus holds all things together. In him, all things hold together. Now, things hold together in Jesus not just in a mechanical way, as in, well, this is just what Jesus does because he's supposed to. Things hold together for you. Things hold together for our community and our world because Jesus is love. God is love. And in Jesus, the love of God is per perfected. It is perfectly shown. It is perfectly communicated. Jesus holds in him all things holds together, hold together because of the love of Jesus for you and for me 
and for all the world. Verse 15 uh, speaks of Jesus as the image of the invisible God. It's not, it's not like a, an image projected on a screen. Instead, it's an awareness that, as John tells us in his gospel, God is spirit. We cannot see God with our physical eyes. Jesus, as he becomes flesh, as he takes on human flesh, makes God visible to us. He is the image, he is the authority of the invisible God. In ancient times, the the image of Caesar, wherever we see that you see the image of Caesar on a coin or in in a portrait, it is to indicate his authority. His authority is present there. Jesus is the authority of God, God in human flesh. And then looking at verse 19, it says, For in Jesus all the fullness of God was pleased. To dwell. Notice that word, pleased to dwell. Uh, God doesn't dwell in Jesus. Jesus doesn't take on human flesh just because he has to. He doesn't have to be talked into it. He doesn't have to have his arm twisted into it. The fullness of God is pleased to dwell. All of God is in Jesus, present in Jesus, and willingly so. Then the very next word, verse, we see that word pleased again, verse 20. And through Jesus, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Jesus endures the sacrifice. He lays down his life uh, for us, not out of compulsion. Uh, Certainly, he experienced the pain. It wasn't something that he longed to experience, but he, he endures the pain and the shame and the suffering of the cross out of love for you and for me and for the world. It pleased God, it pleased Jesus to reconcile us, to redeem creation through the pain and the suffering of the cross. Jesus holds all things together because of God's great love for all of creation. In him, your life is held together. Our life as a church is held together because of the love of God. And this world, marred by sin as it is, is held together by Jesus because of the amazing love, the amazing grace that God has for us. A woman from Boston traveled to Ireland to Uh, reconnect with her Irish roots. Her aunt, her mother's eldest, oldest uh, sister was living there, lived beside a a beautiful lake. And she uh, spent every morning, every early morning, they'd get up and they'd walk around the lake as the sun would rise. And one of those mornings, uh, her elderly aunt, uh, she noticed, had a bigger smile on her face, a little bounce in her step, and then later started to skip along the way. And she kind of The niece kind of teased her aunts. What what has come over you? What has come over you? And she replied, Jesus is very fond of me. Jesus is very fond of me. She knew this truth that all things hold together in Jesus out of the love that Jesus has for all of us. And that needs to be the central anchor for us, the central way we understand our lives, ourselves, who we are as souls made in the image of God, as creatures made in the image of God, people for whom Jesus not only loves because he's supposed to, but who is fond of us because his love is so deep, so personal, and so real. And when we think of the truth of verse 17, that in Jesus all things hold together in love for us, then we can more faithfully, more peacefully rest in his love. We can be still before Jesus as Mary was in our gospel passage. We can work with and for Jesus as Martha does, knowing that the work doesn't depend on us, it depends on Jesus, and we're simply participating in what he calls us to do. We can enter into Sabbath rest, recognizing that when we stop working for a day, the world will go on just fine without us, and God's work will go on just fine without us as we rest in the one who holds all things together. Mandy Smith, Pastor Mandy Smith, puts it, puts it this way. She imagines, she encourages herself, what would it look like for me to wake up every morning 
with this world already humming and just join in the song, join in the humming. That's what we do each morning if we recognize that it's Jesus who holds all things together, not us. And we simply, when we arise, we wake up and we enter into what Jesus is already doing. Which suggests for me, personally, one of the biggest aspects of living in this truth that it is in Jesus that all things hold together. It, this knowledge sets us free to more deeply, more fully engage in the work that God does have for us to do. If, if Jesus holds all things together, if Jesus is the one who's going to bring God's work to completion, if it's not up to us to do that, then we're set free to give our absolute all in whatever it is that God has called us to do because we're not doing God's work, we're participating in God's work. And the Holy Spirit is inspiring us to be a part of all that God is doing now and pointing us to all that God will do one day. Look again at verse 20. Paul says, the hymn says, through Jesus God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, all things. I don't think it's a, it's a, a way of saying that, uh, that all will be saved. God gives us freedom to say yes or no to Jesus and respects that freedom. But it does point to a vision of salvation, a vision of redemption that's, that's larger than we oftentimes think. Larger for humanity, larger for creation. Think of Romans chapter 8 verse 20 where Paul speaks of creation groaning in bondage because of human sin. In verse 21, Paul speaks of creation when Jesus returns being set free from decay, set free from this bondage. One day, heaven and earth will be one, as we'll sing in just a moment in our closing hymn. All will be as God wills it to be. And when we have a vision of what will be, what only God can accomplish, then we can give all of our efforts to helping people around us flourish the way they were meant to flourish, to helping people meet Jesus so they can encounter the one who's already holding things together for them and so that they can live the lives in Jesus' love that they were meant to love and meant to live. When we have this sense of Jesus holding all things together, then we know that when we go to Kentucky, it's not our responsibility to make everything right in a place that's been devastated. But it is our call and it is our invitation to participate in what God is doing in rebuilding a hurting community. And, and when we have this sense of Jesus holding all things together, we can join with our children at the end of the month in, in blessing the families at the Ronald McDonald House. And, and we can be a part of Recovery Point and so many other ministries in our community. We can sing and praise God on Sunday mornings and Sunday evenings at Rev. We can do all manner of things knowing that God takes our songs of praise, our acts of love, our words of witness, and somehow, some way, molds them into the work that Jesus is doing as he holds all things together. We have this good news. Jesus, firstborn from the dead, the one through whom all things were created, the one who lived, died, and was raised for us to reconcile us to God and to each other. Jesus, in him everything holds together. Let us live and rest and serve from that anchor place, that truth that Jesus holds our lives and our world together. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Lord, in this room and watching online at this very moment, there are people, perhaps many people, who are experiencing that 
things falling apart aspect of life in this present creation. May they, may we know and sense and experience the gospel truth that in Jesus all things hold together, even the things that seem to be falling apart for them. In the world all around us, so many things are falling apart, O oh Lord. We thank you that Jesus holds things together. We pray that you would work through us to further that aspect of your work in the world, that we may be participants in your kingdom work, witnesses to the new creation, messengers of hope and love as it is found in Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that as we sing, that our song will, like the hymn from Colossians, bring praise to you in heaven. And as we sing, may we rest in your great, great love for us. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.